Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. And for the faithful, I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you today? Good. Good day, Bruce. Good day. Beautiful outside. Well, it's getting a little hazy, but uh, <laughs> looks like a nice warm day. Looking forward to getting outside. Alrighty, how about you? Oh, all right. I'm looking forward to getting outside. I'm back walking, and uh, I got sick in December, so I lost my streak. But I've I'm up to 140 days again, or something like that. So going strong. Yeah. So good stuff. I was just reading an email there about you, you, the photo issue that we've been dealing oh, with. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. I hope they got a solution. <laughs> I hope so, too. We'll see. Anyway, that's our own stuff. Okay, Bruce, we're going to be talking about um, Ken Holland's summer and going forward, what he can do to improve the team. And we will discuss specific players. Kari Yamamoto, Cody Cece, Warren Fogel. Evan Bouchard, Ryan McLeod, um, Nick Bugstad, Matthias Janmark, Queen Costin. Anyone else? Is that oh, it? We're good. All of the, all of the uh, free agents on both sides of the coin, restricted and unrestricted. But uh, I think that the uh, long and short of it is that Ken Holland's got his work cut out for him this summer. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to uh why don't I start off with um sure. what he said recently himself about his summer. He was on Oilers now and I thought he gave probably his most revealing answer to um what he's going to do this summer to host Bob Stoffer. Um let me just uh here we go. The hard truth bomb as I called it in the headline. Cuz yeah. it, it it seemed almost it was it wasn't like he was outlining his plans it was in response to a question um bob asked him you know um would he be willing to move another first round draft pick for a veteran at a good price point on term with good term you know another kind of ecom trade you know bob was wondering about right. we'd, all, we'd all like another one of those and that's when holland um was was the most forthcoming that he's been um, about what his intention is. And he said, first off, I'm not sure that we have the money. It would have to be someone making peanuts. Mm -hmm. So er, it, there had been a huge number of fans, you know, with Damon Severson and, um, you know, Ivan Barbashev and Tyler Bertuzzi and Alex Kalorn dancing in their head. And that had to be, a fairly sobering comment if that's that you know if that's your hope that the owners are going to bring in another um <laughs> essentially another five million dollar man right to add to their list of five million dollar men um i just i just don't see that's possible in the summer bruce you know even if they went on an aggressive buyout spree and moving players out spree that would be a very difficult proposition, given the fact that you have Evan Bouchard to sign and wouldn't be your first priority. If you could offer him a longer term contract on more money, wouldn't that be your first priority paying Bouchard as opposed to bringing in another player? So I just don't what Holland has been talking about mostly is the thing he's best at, Bruce, is patience, yeah. keeping his powder dry. And waiting to the trade dead, waiting to the trade deadline seems to be mm -hmm. his plan. And the more I thought about it, the more it actually made sense because there's a number of questions about the Oilers roster. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have that information right now. Right. His job is to win the Stanley Cup a year from now, and he has got to make. He doesn't know where the need's going to be on this team. He doesn't know if it's if he makes a move this summer, let's say for a defenseman or a um, a forward. Well, maybe the need is in net. Maybe they've had a, a an injury and the other guy's not playing well and it's a mess and they got to trade for a goalie if they're going to win the Stanley Cup. And um, Or maybe it's defense. That maybe Cody Cece doesn't play well again. 
Maybe Philip Broberg doesn't play well. Maybe Vincent DeHarnay craps out, can't handle the NHL after all. Or there's a major injury or two, and they've got to acquire a defenseman. Same as at forward. There's all kinds of things that could happen at forward. And suddenly your need presents itself for the playoff run that's coming. And um, the reason you have to be careful is you have so little cap space. As you put it in your post today, you've got about six million dollars um, as it stands now, and you've got six players to sign, Up to. roughly. So it's um, there's very little wiggle room here, and you can get a little bit more wiggle room by moving out some players, moving out some contract. Um, but that's easily going to probably be taken by the players on the the current roster, the way I see it. Either, you know, if you moved out money, Bruce, you'd, you'd probably use that money to sign Bouchard or McLeod a little bit longer, possibly, as opposed to bringing in another player, although I'm I'm not sure about that. Anyway, that's how I, that's the the general frame that I'm seeing. What do you see? Yeah, in-house raises are always a big issue. I mean, last year we had uh, uh, Daniel Nurse and uh, Evander Kane each getting uh, more than $3 million more than they got the previous year. And then we had all of Kyle Yamamoto, uh, Yasapul Yarvi, and Brett Kulak getting close to $2 million more than the year before. So to bring back those five guys, which they did, uh, cost the club almost uh, $12 million against the cap for the yeah. same players yeah. like in additional salary. So they had to clear the decks of some, uh, uh, some other contracts and... Uh, uh, you know, they did a, a couple of uh, a couple of good moves. I mean, moving out the Zach Cassian contract was was uh, key uh, to what they were able to do last summer. Uh, but there's not a lot of easy solutions in the team right now. Just the, the way it's top heavy in salary, and the, the top heavy guys are a the guy. You know, I mean, they're they're fundamental to the team for starters. But they're also very well protected in terms of they have long-term contracts, they have no movement clauses, or no, yeah, like straight no movement clauses in them. And some of the simple solutions, like, well, we should move Darnell Nurse away. Well, I don't think that trade is easily accomplished at, at this point in time when the guy's got seven years left at $9 million and, uh, and fans in his hometown complaining about his performance. Well, who's going to go for that? Um, you know, I mean, like it or lump it, they signed him, they committed to him eight years, no move clause. He's going to be around for a while. Uh, so I think they really, could trade him, Bruce, if they want. Uh, if all they the five to. million dollar players. Uh, you, you think they could convince him to go? Well, he's got a no movement clause. You're right. Yeah. So that's the major issue. Yeah. But could they trade Darnell Nurse? I think another team would take Darnell Nurse on that contract. I, mm-hmm. I, I do think so, yeah. I don't agree with the general consensus that right. this is such a massive over ghastly overpay that no one would want that player. I just, I don't see, I, I think lots of teams would want Darnell Nurson at that price. Uh, they don't they have, always would miss him too. They uh, would. Anyway, uh, they've got uh, uh, three expiring contracts in the, uh, in the low range. In fact, of all the contracts they have, uh, which I broke up in my post to, uh, 10, 5, 3, and $1 million class contracts because they all come within a few percent of that one way or another. And of the uh, 10, 5, and $3 million contracts, uh, that's 13 contracts, not one of them expires this con- this summer. They have to find another way. If they want to move it out, they're going to have to trade it, they're going to buy it out, they're going to have to you know, find some way to offload uh, all of those contracts, and meanwhile, of the 11, according to Cap Friendly, um, uh, players in the $1 million range, starting from Derek Ryan and Matthias Janmark, 1.25, and moving down, uh, seven of those contracts have expired. So they either have to re-sign those guys or they have to replace them, but they're not going to replace them for much cheaper because they're already down at sort of the lowest class of contract in the list. In the meantime, you have three expiring uh, restricted free agents that the club probably wants to keep in Evan Bouchard, Ryan McLeod, Tim Coston, uh, all of whom have made a pretty good case for a raise. And I mean, maybe not huge dollars for the last two. Uh, Bouchard, though, that's a real head scratcher. And 
there's just not a whole lot of wiggle room as uh, uh, Ken Holland said, you know, they're not going to be able to pay in pistachios. It's going to be in peanuts. And that's, uh, uh, he's, you know, he's got some headaches in terms of what he can do and in terms of what he can't do. There is a little bit of good news in yep. that Andre Sakura and Milan Lucic's um, yep. Yep. buyouts are, are off the books or re- retentions mm-hmm. are off the books. And um, I think it's 1.5 million with Sakura yep. and 750,000 with yep. uh, Lucic. They paid of Lucic's salary each of the last four years. That's now that contract's finally over. Calgary fans are celebrating, but Edmonton fans can be happy too. And Milan Lucic is celebrating too because he just won the uh, world championship with him. He sure Canada. is. So, and congratulations to him and the other Team Canada players. There's one more piece of good news, Bruce, in that the, the Oscar Clefbaum contract and the Mike Smith contracts are finally up. Yeah. And really. what a sour thing the Oscar Clefbaum story in the end turned out to be in Edmonton. What a sad story. It's, it's the oldest story in hockey injury, upending a promising career. And a contract that looked like it was one of the steals, like a great contract, value contract for years to come, turned out to be this thing that really was harmful to the prospects of the Edmonton owners because due to the NHL's somewhat convoluted rules, when a player goes on LTIR at the start of the year, um, any time there's like the, the, the team isn't spending to the cap, they can't save up that cap money. They can't build up that cap money and then use it later in the year um, at the trade deadline to, to get a really good player when someone's on LTIR. But now they can do that. They, that is my understanding is mm-hmm. all that, if the orders are under the cap through the season, that money doesn't go away. That money accrues to them. And then they can bring in, This is an, and this is another reason to wait, mm-hmm. is you, you amplify the quality of the player that you can bring in at the trade deadline whereas you might be able to get a let's say a good player at three million dollars um mm-hmm. in july here let's say right if you wait um and you only have to pay you know whatever it is one fifth of his salary at the end of the season you can bring in a much much higher priced player like yeah. a like a six seven eight million dollar player potentially uh, potentially at that point, like you, mm-hmm. you're in the running then for the uh, Vladimir Tarasenko's and the Patrick Kane's, not that that helped the New York Rangers. <laughs> um, that kind of player is a possibility for you. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't that be fine? Like it, at the yeah. deadline to load up McDavid's line, um, for instance, or Drysaddle's line with a, with a sharp shooting winger that could happen this year. And that's kind of, that's kind of exciting. Yeah, well, the trick is how do you get enough under the cap to to make, uh, you know, to accrue anything when you, when yeah. you're already at where they're where they're at, with uh, you know, uh, like I say, cap friendly says six million dollars with six roster spaces available, and they're including you know Marcus Niemelainen on the roster, uh, and also uh, Dylan Holloway on the roster. Well, I think well Holloway will make it, but. Nima Lyman won't really like, and he he's at basically minimum salary. In fact, I think he's actually below minimum for next year. So whoever you replace him with, at best, you're sawing off. And I can see Holland going hard on a 21-man roster again next year. I don't think he'll oh, go yeah. 20, but he could go hard on 21 and try and save on, you know, the the extras sitting up in the press box to keep that to a, to a bare minimum. Uh, so there's a tiny bit of wiggle room, but it's. Uh, uh, I kind of agree that your best play is to try and you know keep a little bit under the cap, so that when you get to the trade deadline, all of a sudden you you know you've accrued something that when you're buying the last 40 days of a player's salary at the deadline, uh, that you know that that increased by a factor of four or five, what you can pay that guy. So. That's uh, that's what the smart kids used to do. But last year we had 16 NHL teams in LTIR status, so a whole lot of them were similarly compromised as the Oilers. And last year, with you know, they might even have traded off the Clefbaum contract to give themselves some more flexibility. But they also had the Mike Smith one, so you know they were they were doomed to spend the year on LTIR no matter what. Now both those have cleared up, and uh, 
So for the first time, really, in, in Holland's regime here, he's going to have a regular season that's, uh, that's uh, fully flexible. And, th- I mean, you could say his first season was, but that season went to pot with the COVID uh, mm-hmm. end of the early end of the season, right after the trade deadline. So <sighs> I'd like to see him. I mean, not that he's uh, any wild, you know, trader Phil or anything, but I'd like to see him more with the shackles off of what can you do to, to accrue and maybe get that key piece at the deadline. And as you say, the key piece we don't know what it is yet, right? Last year we were saying, well, it might be the right winger, it might be the goalie, it might be on defense. Well, it turned out to be on defense, and they added a damn good one uh, and made the money work somehow. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure the Oilers would have been any better off if they had Matthias Ekholm from the start of the season in terms of, you know, but uh, they might have finished few points higher in the standings, but the playoffs still would have been the playoffs, is I guess yeah. my take. He did okay with the shackles on at the trade deadline, you know, Evander Kane one year and Matthias Ekholm the next. That's uh, that's some pretty good work by Ken Holland and goes a long way in me uh, having positive feelings about him as a GM. Like those mm-hmm. two moves um, were outstanding. Um, moves by Holland. So Bruce, the obvious thing for most fans, I mean, I did a poll on uh on this and it was it was like should the oilers keep Kyler yamamoto or not and um it's uh it's not unanimous <laughs> but it's it's uh if if Kyler yamamoto is listening to this he might just want to stop listening right now uh it was <laughs> It was as close to unanimous, you know, it was like, I think it was 80, let me just see if I can get the exact results here. Um, 88%, I think it was, where they, they think he should either be traded or bought out. And um, it it's all to do with, um, well, when I dug into it, there's I identified uh, a number of reasons why. Yamamoto, here, here's the poll. Uh, okay. And the survey says, come on. Um, it was 88-12 last time I looked at it. 88 to 12, 87.8 to 12.2. Seven out of eight people yeah. think he should be gone. And that had 2,200 people voting in it. Oh. So that's fairly representative of what Edmonton Oilers fans are thinking. So that's that's really tough news for for Yamamoto. But Bruce, there was a number of reasons. And, and, and it was interesting, the most, like the one I hadn't thought about, but I think, you know, his even strength scoring, first of all, hasn't been great, even though he's played so much with McDavid and Dreisaitl. So, um, you know, he's played more than half of his even strength minutes with the, mm-hmm. on the orders with Dreisaitl. And about a, a quarter of the, his minutes, or uh, you know, a quarter to a third of his minutes with McDavid, and he's had when he's been with both of them in that brief period. When, period when you've had that line together, they've done really well. And he's done. Drysaddle's done well with Yamamoto as well. McDavid's hasn't made much impact on his numbers, but his scoring, Yamamoto's scoring, is just not. It's it ranks about. If you go back the last three seasons, and this excludes Yamamoto's brief, great first season with the Oilers, right. but it, but it's the last three seasons. I think it does mm-hmm. kind of cover w- where he's at as a player. And if you look at his even strength scoring in that time period, he ranks, I think it's like about 300 uh, of NHL forwards who have played about 800 minutes, even strength minutes in that time. He ranks... Um, uh, the exact number is Kyler Yamamoto, 301st out of 451 forwards. And that's playing that much with McDavid and Dreisaitl. Two thirds of the way down the list. And this is five on five, eh? Like this is this is five on five. So this and is a level playing field for all 451 of those guys, in a sense. He's below Derek Ryan and even strength scoring. He's below Warren Fogle. And those guys didn't get much time. Makes me wonder if the Oilers wouldn't have been way better off this year playing Derek Ryan all that time. 
yeah. with uh, Leon Dreisaitl as opposed to Kyler Yamamoto. Um, he just he just hasn't got it done. The other thing is um, he's he keeps getting injured, and this continues to impact his quality of play. It really really had a big impact this past season when he was yeah. out three three different times, and um, he got injured in the playoffs last year towards the end of the playoffs. So players can fight through injuries. And I know a lot of people say, well, he's so small, he's going to keep getting hurt. Not necessarily so. He could he could turn it around. And I mean, he did score 20 goals the season before. He played 81 games and he scored 20 goals. But I think really, Bruce, the deciding factor on this player is his playoff performance. And mm-hmm. what I did was I looked at, you know, so we rate the players based on their um, even strength play. Um, and how many con- major contributions do they make to grade A shots? You know, how often do they get them? How often do they set them up or screen the goalie? Or how, you know, what is their exact contribution to a grade A shot? And then we compare that to how many times they make a, a major mistake on a grade A shot against, you know, they, they back check weekly or they, they make a bad line change or they allow a slot shot from their man and they're not covering their guy. Um, or they allow a pass into the slot. And Yamamoto, um, he's done okay. He had an absolutely outstanding first season in this regard. When he was with the Dynamite line, the year Dreisaitl won the MVP because largely based on the strength of this incredible line of him, Yamamoto, and Nugent Hopkins that they just looked like magic that year. And uh, Yamamoto's even strength play was outstanding on that line. And his number on grade A shots reflected that. But every single year, Bruce... um, since then, he's been just okay at even strength in the regular season. But every single season, his performance has dropped in the playoffs by this yeah. metric as compared to his regular season. And to the point this year, his effectiveness is, as a two-way player was essentially cut in half from his regular season play. And his level of, um, you know, his grade A shots plus minus per game, is it a level where you tend to move out that player? It's so weak for a winger. Um, he's just, he's just giving up too much on defense. He's not creating enough on the attack. It's so weak that you're just thinking, oh, we got to get rid of this guy. And you compound that with his salary then, of 3.1 million. And the fact that's easily bought out with, um, minimal penalty and uh, considerable savings and the the team's need for money. It does seem like Kari Yamamoto's days at Edmonton are over and, I think it's a reasonable decision as much as I've cheered for this player, admired this player and, and hoped this player would live up to his potential. It hasn't worked out and it's he'll, he, I think he will be moving on shortly. Yeah. Well, I'll, I think be seeing if they can move him on, if there's a fit somewhere and there, and there may well be, I mean, he's a 24 year old forward, former first round pick who scored 20 goals year before last, you know I mean? Uh, he can probably help, some teams in the NHL, whether that team is the Edmonton Oilers, and especially whether it's the Edmonton Oilers in the playoffs is an open question. I mean, you talk about our our own um, measures of scoring chances. Well, here's the NHL's traditional plus minus. Uh, And in the last four years, uh, since he's been an NHL regular, uh, Yamamoto's been at uh, uh, plus 37 in the regular season, scoring a little over half point per game. With, uh, without a lot on the power play. And in the playoffs, uh, he uh, they played 34 playoff games for the Oilers, three goals, nine assists, minus 16 in the playoffs. Oh. The last two years, he's been the worst minus on the team both years, minus six and minus seven in the playoffs. Uh, and... Uh, I know plus minus isn't popular, but for a player like Yamamoto, it actually doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. It's not like he's out there in empty net situations. It's not like he's out there in a lot of power plays. He does a little bit of penalty killing, but that plus minus is pretty much going to be reflected in what he's done at even strength. And I know in this year's playoffs, it was uh, two, four, and eight against. Uh, I think that was just in the Vegas series where he had four shots on net in six games. You know, I mean, he just wasn't contributing offensively. And 
Uh, defensively, I thought he played about the worst defense that I've seen from him. Like I've usually admired him as a defensive player, really good with the stick, brave on the getting in the shooting lanes and stuff. And he was just getting beat, overwhelmed. Like guys were just pushing back, past and through him and and taking it, you know. Uh, and I just uh, wasn't seeing a whole lot of positive uh, from uh, from the player in the postseason, other than. The one and only series winning goal that Edmonton scored, which was his one and only goal in the entire playoffs and and something of a, a you know, a, a, a Californian at that. But <laughs> threw it at the net and it went in. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when he got past the puck and close to the net, man, he just whiffed on so many chances. Just whiffed. I don't know what it is with his hands or if it's a panic level or what it is, but it seemed like anytime somebody teed him, if he could tip the puck, great. But if he had to handle it, forget it. Yeah, and then, you know, and then it didn't help that Kane's hands were, you know, he apparently had a broken finger and and then his wrist thing. And he so he wasn't able to, to, to uh, score very well. And then Hyman... Um, he's not a sniper in the first place. And then Nugent Hopkins, his hands went away in the playoffs, it seemed as well. It was just like a nightmare in the top six on the wings in terms of having a sniper. Yeah. This is why I was dreaming there momentarily of, a, you know, that big contract sniper coming at the trade deadline. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a cliche that smaller players and finesse players sometimes fade in the playoffs. It's a stereotype. But sometimes stereotypes, there's, you know, there there can be some truth to them. And in this case, he's just living up to that. He's just, he is getting pushed around and pushed out of the play in the playoffs. And we've seen it, essentially, we've seen it four years in a row. And there's enough evidence that it, is it going to change? I mean, Jordan Everly was moved out essentially for the same reason, mm-hmm. Um and I think that Everly, ha- he's a bit bigger of a player, but he did find a way, he has found a way yeah. to become he's a useful playoff, playoff performer. So this is the, you know, I might take a look, you know, and just another look and try to argue the other side of it. Keep Yamamoto and try to think of all the reasons why you might. And there is a chance that he could figure it out in the playoffs and find out, figure out a way to become an effective playoff performer as good as he is in the regular season. And then you, you, you'd you also say, well, you know, the reason he wasn't good in the regular season this year as compared to last year is he just got banged up so much. And that can change, too. Players have injured seasons, and you don't move them out every single time. Sometimes you wait, and you, you see if they turn it around. And there's every chance that he could turn it around and become a strong regular season player again. This is why I'm actually hopeful they won't have to buy him out, though, more than anything that they, they will be able to move him to a team that, that's desperate for, you know, like an Arizona or a Chicago or some team in the East that's lower down in the standings, that needs a forward that can um, help them compete in the coming season. And I, I think you should be able to find that team and, and hopefully you'll, you'll pick up a, a draft pick for Yamamoto. I think that would be reasonable. I don't think they're going to have to resort to the buyout. No. But um, that might... In, Involve waiting um, to the to the uh, draft. Um, I th- and right. I'm not sure when the first buyout period is. Is it not before the draft? No, but it's it's close to. I mean, it everything overlaps this year. Yeah, the draft is on close. June 28th, 29th. Oh yeah, and the, and then old contracts die on the 30th, and free agency opens on July 1st. So I'm not quite sure where I, I, I checked where within there the buyout window happens, but it's pretty hard to squeeze it in between the draft and the and yeah. the uh, uh, free agency when you've only got one day to do it. And of course, players being bought out, they they deserve to be able to join the market on July 1st. I mean, it'd be cruel and unusual to them. Of course, it's always possible that the Oilers would have a player that filed for arbitration, which would open a second buyout window later. But the buyout for Yamamoto, uh, compared to all the other hideous ones that we've endured over the years, where it's millions of dollars for four or six or eight years on a, some guy that they that they bet wrong on, for uh, Yamamoto, uh, it's just two years total buyout, uh, and the cap hits would be 433 and 533, so less than a million dollars total spread over two years compared to 3.1 million next year, and so that would open up two point almost 2.7 million dollars in 23-24 for uh, 
uh, an upgrade and $2.7 million, you could probably do an upgrade and maybe not spend it all and come out ahead. But it's, I mean, it's a sad state of affairs. We've all been rooting for this guy, but I think the injuries and, uh, um, you know, not just injuries, but I think concussions or whiplash, like he just wasn't himself. And when he was out there, I mean, his his whole thing is his battle levels off the charts when he's playing well. Yeah. And he had a few games like that. And a lot of games were just not much, you know. So if we were to do the keep, hold or fold with Yamamoto, Bruce, what what camp would you be in? Uh, I'm getting near the fold camp. Yeah, near the fold camp, uh, uh, you know, they just they just don't have the cap space to to yeah. wait and hope, you know. I, and the other thing is, the one other factor which I didn't raise yet is, or is, they have these young forwards, mm-hmm. Dylan Holloway, Raphael Lavoie. They've got a these guys are Xavier. ready for their NHL. Xavier Borgo, maybe another year from now, but mm-hmm. Lavoie is at the end of his ELC. And uh, Holloway has one more year, I think. These guys are ready. They need to get their NHL shot. Holloway was probably ready for a little more ice time this year. If he hadn't gotten hurt, might have got it. Mm-hmm. He's a bigger forward. Um, he, we'll see if he's given that same opportunity. I mean, it's not going to be too hard to replace Kyler Yamamoto's 1.4 points per 60. You know, I'm, I, I suspect either Lavoie or Holloway could do that. Yep. Um, and would they be also more physical, bigger, more physical players? Yes. Um, both of them would be, would they be as good defensively? Well, in the playoffs, Yamamoto wasn't that good defensively and mm-hmm. he wasn't that good defensively this year either. Like he, mm-hmm. he took a step back in all aspects of his game, yeah. probably related to injury yes. more than anything else is to be fair, completely fair to him. And he just, it was just one thing after another. So, but you have these guys, Bruce. Um, Lavois is what six three six four two twenty Holloway six one two ten two oh five something like that. These are big aggressive uh, hockey players that could really help the others a lot. So it's just to me, I'm definitely in the fold camp. You got to move on from Kari Yamamoto, and um, and so that means I would buy him out, like because I'm in the fold camp. If you can't trade him, I would buy him out, but I do think they'll be able to trade him. And uh, like Chicago, oh, Chicago's got to be desperate for for players. And um, Arizona. Well, they got Connor Bedard, but they went out and they traded Alex DeBrinkett and Kirby Dock and, and Dylan Strome at the beginning of last year. So Connor Bedard arrives and he's going to have nobody around him. Well, exactly. And now Yamamoto's a smaller well. player, just like Bedard is, so that he's not ideal. Yeah. But um, he none the so he's not ideal for Bedard's line, but he's ideal for the second line that Bedard's not on. Like to to have another line that attracts a little attention, perhaps. So yeah, they they should it just it should actually be a fairly straightforward move for that that team as well. But you just never know what Chicago's going to do right now. Okay. Um, they seem to be in their own space, their own worldview about how to build an NHL hockey team. We'll see how that goes, Bruce. Um, why don't we move on to that 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 other the other players in that group who are Warren Fogle, Cody CC, who else? Uh, Brett Kulak. Yeah, and the last one is Stu Skinner, who is a yeah. lo- locked in as he just signed a contract to get into that range. So before the deadline, the fifth one was Jesse Pugliarvi, and he was the only one who was expiring in 2023, so easier to move, and he got moved for cap space. But Skinner. Uh, you know, 2.6 for the next three years. He isn't going anywhere. So, uh, but the other three guys, I think they're all a little bit vulnerable. Yeah. And mostly due to cap uh, reasons and also due to the fact they don't have trade protection. The Oilers can't solve this problem by moving out from one of their $5 million players because they're covered off. And whereas a, a $3 million guy like um, uh, Fogel, uh, or CC uh, or, or, or Kulak, really, you know, they could be moved out and say, well, we, we got to replace that guy with a $1 million and that'll create cap space somewhere else. And so uh, all of them are okay players. I don't, you know, I don't dislike what any of them does on the ice. CC had a 
I'd say a lot tougher year this year than last year. That's due to a core body injury that was sort of going through the ranks all year. Now, what I don't know is if that core body injury is chronic or or permanent or whether it's something they can fix. I haven't heard anything about him, uh, uh, you know, getting it fixed. So, uh, and he was just so painfully slow last year. I thought, you know, reacting and getting to pucks in the corner and trying to clear them out was an adventure. And uh, so, uh, but also, is there a market for that guy? Like, if you want to move him, you got no 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 trade clauses, but uh, you need to find a trading partner that's willing to take take him on, take his salary on, and hopefully at least give you something back in return. Then you got to replace him. So it's not easy. Yeah, I think there's probably a market for Cody CC too. And I, like again, the Chicago Blackhawks, th- that would just be an obvious move for him because Cody CC is not a bad hockey player at all. Mm-hmm. Um, he's capable of playing in the top four. He did a good job the, when he wasn't injured. Uh, with the Oilers so I and again I I actually and I think we'll do a like a more detailed dive into CC and a we'll do a complete kind of keep holder fold podcast upcoming where we really get into it but I I, I just think he's in that camp of players injured this year uh, wasn't that wasn't that good was pretty good though when he wasn't injured the year before so he's still a veteran player he's hard to replace he's not earning that much money good luck replacing him like I I yeah. What I would no seriously, good luck. And now they, they might think Philip Broberg can do it, and and maybe Philip Broberg can, and maybe this is a situation where you move out Tyson Berry and you give Evan Bouchard a chance. So you move out Cody Cece, and then you're you're betting on Philip Broberg stepping in there. Hey, there's a real chance. There's a chance Philip Broberg could could be as good as Cody Cece was certainly last year, and um, so it's it's not crazy to think that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. But it's you know that's you're it's getting a little dicey, and then you then you only have six D men that you like, you know who are you going to count on if someone one of them gets hurt or two of them gets hurt, you're gonna then you're asking Marcus Niemelainen to come up and um, Phil Kemp to come up, and it's it's starting to get a little dicier unless you can then unless you can sign a one million dollar veteran D man, which is a real possibility. So I. I, I'm in, and Fogel, he, 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 the calendar year, Warren Fogel was great on the wing. He was just ripping up and down the wing, playing hard hockey, playing smart hockey, really added to the Oilers in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Um, Kulak was the obvious guy to move out in the first half of the season. And then he just took off, his game took off. And in the playoffs, he was outstanding, which shows you how quickly things change for players in terms of public um, in terms of how we rate and rank them and, and the what the public has to say about them. I think if you had asked this question in, in early December, you would have had 80% of Oilers fans saying, move out Kulak, the first chance you get. And um, move on, time to move on. This guy didn't cut it in the top four. And he's uh, he's making, he's leaking mistakes. He's falling down on the ice. He's, <laughs> he's not very good. And... Uh, but things changed. He was fantastic in the playoffs for the second year in a row. Yeah. So uh, I don't see them moving out Brett Kulak and um, yeah, or Fogel and not certainly not Skinner. Now the, the one player, Bruce, there's some people that are convinced the owners are going to bring back Nick Bugstad and that's like a no brainer and you just got to bring him back. And, and uh, so if they move out Yamamoto, they might have, enough money in theory i still think it would be super tight like yeah. I, I see them with all of the any bottom six center that they sign i see them signing for about 1.1 million a year you know whatever that cutoff is when you go when you can be sent to the hl without costing the NH, your nhl any cap hit that's the figure that that all these forwards are going to be offered mm-hmm. and i don't see them able to offer I guess they're going to have to offer more to McLeod because he's a rising young player, but I don't see them making that making a big move to keep Nick Bugstad at let's say a million eight a year, which is what some people are talking about him making. I don't see it happening. What do you? I mean, he was okay in the playoffs in a limited role. I, I I don't I don't think it's a bad idea to bring him back, but I don't see how they can if he wants to get. 1.8 million or 2 million dollars a year. 
Yeah, well, he was brought in at uh, 50%. So they only paid him $450,000 cap hit last year. So he's going to get a big raise. I mean, he'd get a decent size raise just to get back to the minimum. Yeah. In terms of what Edmonton's paying for him. He, of course, had a cap hit of 900000 last year. Second time in a row, he'd sign a one-year contract for 900000 But before that, he had a six-year deal at $4.1 million per year. And he didn't really quite live up to that. I think injuries was a big issue with uh, with Nick as well. And he did some good things in Edmonton. I thought he looked real good in the in the end of the season. Had some good impact against LA. I didn't think he was so good against uh, Vegas, to be honest. And uh, uh, when um, uh, he got matched up against the Jack Eichel line, that was not a good match for Edmonton at all. Ooh. That and, line was such uh, a disappointment. Yeah. Him, Eugene Hopkins, and Hyman. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, they wanted him into center to strengthen up the defense on the center, but it just didn't really, really pan out. And so I'm sort of in between on on how even to value this player. But if he thinks he's going to convert his, you know, pretty good season, 17 goals, into 1.5 or 2 million dollars on the market. Uh, that's probably going to have to be somewhere else. And there's just, you know, six million for six players. Do the math. You haven't got two or three million for one of them. You've got, you know, I mean, even McLeod's figure, it's going to have to start with a one. Oh, and, yeah. You know, I mean, I don't think you're looking at any kind of significant, but it will start with a one, not with a 0 0.7 like it did last year. Yeah. And so he, he'll, you know, and all those little little raises will add up. So they've got to uh, hold the line somewhere. And I, I, I just don't think all of Bukestad, uh, Ryan, and Janmark will be back. Uh, and, and sure, I think one to two of them will be back. Yeah. Well, I think if they're willing to take the minimum contract, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a rush to see who gets those contracts. I think Ryan could be back. You know, he's obviously at the top of the list <clears throat> based on his outstanding mm -hmm. regular season and playoffs. Um, yeah. Jan Mark, I thought, you know, he he tailed off at the end of the year in the playoffs due to injury. Um, True. But I think he, he could easily be back, and I'd like to see him back. He's a great penalty killer. The Oilers have weaknesses there. Um, we'll see um, Shore. He had a strong second half. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with him. From the moment like he got sent down, David, he got he he was on the transaction wire for a month. But from the moment he got called back in emergency uh, situation because the Oilers were down to 19 players, and he kind of got a second life after clearing waivers, and he was back on the team within days, and he played every game for what month or six weeks and he was really good it was the best he played i think in his uh three years here in edmonton devonshore and at the price point i mean if if you got a, a veteran at nhl minimum well he either makes the team or he doesn't and if you can wave him then you've got a you know a veteran you can call up and if you can't wave him well the problem such as it is has gone away and minimum contracts are not the problem the problem is anything over the minimum, and even like Matthias Janmark discovered, minimum plus five hundred thousand, a pretty decent pay for a you know a veteran player. That cost him his job in the NHL at the start of the season because they could not squeeze him under the cap. They could squeeze Devin Shore eight fifty under the cap. They could not squeeze Matthias Janmark twelve fifty under the cap, and those little margins, like one way to consider salaries is to look at the amount of the uh, salary cap and then subtract the NHL minimum because that's what it's going to cost you at minimum to replace that guy mm -hmm. barring you know special circumstances like retention and a trade that's uh, uh and so when you look at well Derek Ryan minimum plus 500,000 T.C. Anmark, minimum plus 500000 compared to all those other guys that were in the nine, eight, or even $700,000 range. Sometimes it just made more sense, uh, or the only way it worked for the org was to bring up one of those really tiny contracts. And it uh, more and more these days, the NHL is, you want an NHL paycheck, you might have to expect a low check. 
And certainly lots of veterans are finding that out uh, the hard way in Yanmark's case. And uh, that uh, uh, the lower their salary it is, the more likely it is they're going to be in the NHL or, or at least be on the, you know, the transaction wire. They can be called up because the team can afford it. So it's a, it's a it's the way the contracts have stratified during this cap era where we have now a few really high paid players and then a whole stack of other guys down near the minimum. And we're finding veterans, good veterans, uh, down in that latter category. So I think that's where Holland will be shopping this summer, frankly, is in the million dollar range, veteran forward defenseman, see what he can find in the market after the original after the initial rush is over. What did Colorado play pay for Evan Rodriguez this year? Just let me check oh, because that guy was a hell of a two million. Yeah. Two million? Man, that guy, I, every time I saw him play, I thought, what a player he is. He's he was really decent. Uh yeah, two million. So um I don't know if they'll be able to afford a player like that on the bargain basement this year. But That'd be nice. Anyway, like it's, it's, um, you know, they have to sign Evan Bouchard. Yeah. He's finally off his ELC. And if they had their druthers, they'd probably, if they could, they'd sign him long term, I, I bet, and uh, try to get him locked up for as long as they could. And they can't because they don't have the money, they don't have the cash right. space. So um, it's going to be like the Darnell Nurse situation where you just keep, grinding it out over the years and he's underpaid for for a long time Mm -hmm. and then finally you get to the end and he signs this mega contract if he's a good player like nurse was at that time and um that's how it's gonna be so you know hopefully evan bouchard it works out so well Mm -hmm. that he does earn that big contract four or five years from now and um that'd be fantastic well my view is that i mean yeah, sure. It'd be nice to sign Bouchard for eight times eight or whatever people are saying, which would, I mean, if you're going to give him that, give it to him in three years because it'd still be good. Uh, sign to a either a one-year extension where he doesn't have any negotiating power at all, and you might be able to keep that down in the maybe the twos, I'm not sure. Uh, if they go two or three years, that price is going to go up. And, and the contract will expire while he's still a restricted free agent. But part of the goal of the team here is to maximize what they can do in the next three years when McDavid is under you know his current contract. So signing Bouchard at a lower rate for three years as opposed to a big bigger rate for seven or eight years is maybe the play. They got you know they got to keep the whole cap under. I mean, they can't afford to give them six million this year. They got six million for six players, not one. So, I, I think the play is to get as much money you can. You know, you move out Yamamoto's money and give that to Bouchard. Uh, you know, try to give him a little longer term mm-hmm. on his deal because he he could easily get a point a game, Bruce, this year oh, on that power God. play. I mean, he that's what he averaged, right? Yeah. More than a point a game after. The trade After March first, yeah. Under Tyson points Barry, in thirty-three games. <laughs> Tyson Barry was the top-scoring defenseman mm-hmm. in the NHL. What was it? Three years ago now. Um, two years ago, yeah. Two oh. years ago, playing on that power play, so mm-hmm. he's going to get a lot of points. Yeah. And in the NHL, you get paid for points. Yeah. And um, yeah, just sign him if you can sign him to a three-year deal. Now that'd be great. Just they tried to keep him down, you know. I mean. They had Barry there. I mean, they could have given Bouchard the job at the beginning of last year, moved Barry out, and it would have all been great. Now we'd be saying, well, we haven't Bouchard at 80 points this year. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, he got 40 points. So he, he uh, But he had such a strong playoffs as well that I think even though he has no uh, real negotiating power, he's still got that, you know, offer sheet potential. And so, and he's got the points. So, you know, he's got some negotiating power. He's got more than Ryan McLeod did. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it would be a, a shame to lose Evan Bouchard <laughs> on an offer sheet, to say the least. Um, or to have to match it. Or to have to match it. That'd just be brutal. You'd be moving out CC, Fogel, uh, Yamamoto, and. If you could. And other teams sink. would know you had to move them, and they'd be taking you to the cleaners at the trade-off front. Whew. 
Yeah, you want to screw the Oilers? Okay. Now, Evan Bouchard, you know, the Everybody question is... Everybody wants to screw the Oilers. Would, would Bouchard, <laughs> but would Evan Bouchard want to screw the Oilers? And because that's what that does, right? Mm. And it depends. That comes mm. down to, you know, it's that comes down to, because of the unique nature of the salary cap, the money you get doesn't go to your teammates. And, you know... Um, if you were to do that, that would be an interesting move. I, I could see the Oilers moving on from Bouchard at that point, taking the draft picks, depending on what the contract offer is, right? Like um, how many draft picks you're getting and right. that kind of thing. And then bringing in a, you know, like a Shane Gostas Beher or someone else like that to, to run the power play. Um, so we'll see what happens. Anyway, we're, we're, we're dealing in the, uh, Offer sheets in the NHL are few and yeah. far between, but um, it could happen. It's uh, Chicago Blackhawks. Maybe that that'll be their play. <laughs> hey, in that case, you take the draft picks, uh, because in the short high term, picks. yeah, high picks for uh, for that. All right, Bruce. Well, let's. Uh, anything else? Any other thoughts? Yeah. It's gonna be well, more, compared to other off seasons, I think. Yeah, well, the draft is going to be boring, eh? Because yeah. they got no first round pick. They only got one pick in the top 150. I mean, we're going to be covering it, obviously, but we're going to be covering it more for trades than I think we are for, you know, when they pick the next Swedish goalie in the sixth round. We're going to be just in the dark as we were last year. But there's nobody in the sort of top end of the draft. They only have like one pick at number 57. Probably will trade it down and get two. You know, that's Holland's usual style. But uh, that's still, you know, nothing real juicy when you're talking about trading at number 57. So, the, <laughs> anyway, so. Do you think uh, they could get a third uh, pick for Yamamoto? I don't think they could uh, get a second. Uh, yeah, probably third is, third would be probably about as good as you could expect. So Yeah, that's what I would yeah. guess too. Yeah. I do want to amplify your comments, David, on uh, uh, Canada at the World Championships winning their 28th gold medal to move ahead of Russia on the all-time standings list, 28 to 27 goals. And they did it with a team that you wouldn't have bet a lot of money on two weeks ago. Uh, it started off 0-2. And... Uh, did they know they... But they, but they had a couple of a couple of nasty losses in the early going, but they just came on and got better and better. And the way the schedule fell for them was uh, was uh, pretty fortunate that uh, you know Latvia upset Sweden, so Canada had to play Latvia in the semifinal. Germany upset USA, so Canada got to play Germany in the final. And they won tough games, both of them. Latvia and Germany were both good. And actually, to me, the highlight of the worlds was Latvia winning their first ever medal population 1.8 million they declared a national holiday in latvia today to celebrate their bronze medal at the world championships so all you people that say the world championships don't mean nothing and the bronze medal game is pointless well not to latvians it sure isn't the celebration at the end of that game was nuts and then uh, for germany their first medal at the world's in 70 years and of course for canada uh back on the high on the podium for the manyth time but uh, to, to see the flags of Canada between Germany and Latvia go up at the end of the game it's I'm pretty sure going to be a once in a lifetime vision because it was the two major upsets to have those two teams in the medal round and winning medals at the expense of the United States who lost to both of them in overtime <laughs> You know, if that Team Canada team was in the NHL, for instance, it wouldn't be a terrible team. No. Nope. It, it, it might even battle for the playoffs. I mean, it's got Mackenzie Weger and mm -hmm. um, uh, Tyler Toffoli, um, mm -hmm. Jack Quinn, Cody Glass, Peyton Krebs, Adam Fantilli, like who's going to be taking Lots second or third players. overall. Lawson Krause, who's a good good hockey Chasey player. Ever. Sammy Blay, you know, a tough grinder, and Peyton Krebs, Cody Glass, you know, it's Scott Lawton. So it's it's not that terrible a team actually. It's it's it has a feeling actually of an expansion team. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, not terrible. I mean, they won the gold medals, so clearly not terrible. But they also did the standard Canadian thing of being way better after two weeks of playing together than they were in, uh, you know, in the early going of the round robin where these guys are, what was your name again? You know, yeah. and, and these Canadian teams have a history and, uh, of developing chemistry over a fairly short tournament that they're a lot tougher foe at the end than they were at the beginning. And, and uh, they proved it again. I mean, the depth of Canadian hockey is like no other, where you can go way down into the depth chart to find guys. And, you know, I mean, two happy stories for me, uh, um, uh, ex-Oilers, uh, uh, Milan Lucic, hats off to you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, 34, almost 35 years old, representing Canada for the first time. And they made him the offer, and he jumped at it and went and played well. He set up the winning goal in the semifinal game. Uh, he made a terrific play in the build-up to uh, uh, the 4-2 goal in the gold medal game. And, and he, uh, you know, limited, I thought, on the big ice, this is going to be fun, you know. Uh, and uh, yet uh, he was able to do okay, and uh, clearly it meant a huge amount to him. And, and, and like I say, good on you, and good on you, Ethan Bear going over and representing Canada for the first time and uh, coming back with the gold. Unfortunately, he got hacked on the hand in the very last second of the quarterfinal. Uh, he missed the last two games because of a cheap shot by Kasperi Kapanen, uh, which was unnecessary, but unfortunately it put Ethan out and uh, and still, and he'd been playing really well. So good on those guys, but really you know, good on the whole team for getting her done and representing our country well yet again. So lots, lots of people don't care, but it's, this tournament's always been big for me. I would love the World Championship. It's always interesting. and Unexpected things tend to happen. You know, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> the Oilers are going to have to sign some players mm -hmm. to fill out their um, AHL team. And I wonder if we're going to see some signings from Europe this, this year. That might be one yeah. of the, the uh, yeah. things we'll be writing about in the next few weeks is one or yeah. two players coming over from... From there, and I wonder if Lucic, based on the strength of that performance, gets a contract in Europe, like to go play in Switzerland for a year or um, Sweden. Wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me that he would go to the Swiss league, for instance. I mean, to finish out out his career. Um, Croatian league, maybe. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Slovenia is an Anzi Kopitar Slovenia. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that, that, that's. Uh, I didn't have a chance to cover that in my big post on Holland's future last night of, of how much space there is to fill in the AHL. Partly that's Keith Gretzky's job, but partly yeah. he's just so focused on the big club. He's got a lot of work to do on, on multiple levels. The organization and, does. It's, yeah. a, it's a big summer. They didn't seem to get any U.S. college free agents to speak of, did they? A couple guys. but Yeah, um, but none of the big name guys. So <laughs> it looks like European, you know, you can get some good players in Europe to um, – to play for your AHL team and, you know, who might be NHLers, you know, it's a possibility. So at least we don't have to count the on the next Theodore Lenstrom, David. That guy could play hockey, that Theodore Lenstrom. <laughs> That's the old yeah. person. Remember how much we were. <laughs> Joel Patterson, <man. laughs> oh, what was the other guy? He's still playing. Um, Ava, Johan Avatu. Oh yeah. Johan Avatu. He actually made it for the Oilers as a seventh. But yeah, he did. Anyway, they're they're they they're going to have to dig up a couple of these players from somewhere, and ideally, someone who can make a difference. So, Leonard, yeah. Leonard Patrell, <laughs> bring back Leonard Patrell, the mighty oak of Finland. All right, Bruce, thanks for talking today. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>